Russell. He is with the uh, Atlas Coal Mine National Historic Site, and he's going to be talking to us today about a project that uh, used the reorg methodology, but it wasn't part of the Reorg Canada program. So it was a completely independent use of the methodology. So it'll be very interesting to see, you know, how they used it and uh, how they made it work for them. So Ken, please. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, as Mr. Lambert said, I'm Ken Hazel uh, from the Atlas Coal Mine, and we're going to talk a little bit about our reorg project that we undertook in 2015. It's been a few years to sort of see how far we've come since then. Oops, I skipped. How do I go back? There we go. Okay. Uh, so the Atlas Coal Mine National Historic Site is in Drumheller, Alberta. Has anyone ever been to the Atlas? A few. Okay, I was expecting to have zero. I knew one had already been there. Uh, but it's in Drumheller, Alberta. It's about an hour and a half northeast of Calgary. And it is Canada's most intact and largest historic coal mining site. Uh, started operations in 1936 and ceased operations in 1979. Uh, over the years in the Drumheller Valley, there were over 110 coal mines, and we were the last one to cease operations. Last uh, load of coal went out in 1979. This building right here is called a tipple. It's the last remaining wooden tipple in Canada, and it functions quite similarly to a grain elevator. It sorts coal by different sizes, loads it into trains, and this is really the reason why we are now a nationally designated historic site, because we are the last surviving example of this kind of building. As I said, about an hour northeast of Calgary, in what's called the Canadian Badlands. A very unique landscape uh, for those who haven't been. When I first came, I thought it looked like Mars or the moon. <laughs> um, and what you see is the results of glacial erosion. So in the last ice age, when all the ice retreated, massive river carved out this river valley, now the Red Deer River Valley. And in prehistoric times, this area was much closer to the equator at the edge of an inland sea. And this led to Drumheller becoming a, a very rich fossil bed. Lots of dinosaurs lived here. This is one of the richest fossil beds in the world. Uh, but the same geologic forces that preserved all those fossils also led to the creation of vast coal reserves, actually the largest domestic coal reserves in the country. You can see these black bands. Those are coal seams sandwiched in between layers of sandstone and clay. Uh, they range from just a few inches thick to over 10 feet thick. And the Atlas coal mine was actually fortunate to mine one of these 10-foot thick solid seams of coal. A little bit about myself. I'm collections manager at the Atlas coal mine. Degree in history from York University. Currently uh, pursuing master's in museum studies from the Harvard Extension School. It's an online master's program. If anyone has any questions about that, I'd be happy to answer. It's quite the program. I came out to the Atlas in 2012 uh, for a summer job. I was planning on being there for four months. I'm still there six years later. <laughs> uh, if you had told me that when I first came in the summer that I'd be there six years later, I wouldn't have believed you, and my friends would have told me probably not to go. Uh, but I've progressed from being seasonal collections technician to, in 2015, the Reorg Project Officer, and now I am Collections Manager at the Atlas Coal Mine and also the nearby East Cooley School Museum, which is just across the river. So I'd like to start you off with a little uh, coal mining quote. Keep digging even if the roof caves in. It's good advice if you're a coal miner. Uh, rock falls definitely did happen. So you, if you're you know, stuck in the coal, falls down, and you definitely want to keep digging, but it also parallels, you know, our progress with collections management. You always want to keep digging, 
there's a light at the end of the tunnel, believe me. And, you know, if you keep at it, hopefully you'll get there. And I like, oh, first I meant to ask, was anyone at the AMA conference in 2016? So after uh, doing our 2015 REARC project, I was invited to speak at the AMA conference. And unbeknownst to me, but uh, Charlie Costain of the CCI was there. Uh, so I'm glad no one was here, so I can use all my corny jokes from my last presentation. Uh, but so Charlie Costain saw my presentation and invited me to come here. Uh, so I'd like to start off with this picture. This is me circa April 2015, just before we began Reorg. I think the long hair and the scraggly beard sort of parallels our progress with collections. This is what <laughs> this is what the atlas was like before I started, and, and we'll see how that progresses. So the Atlas Coal Mine National Historic Site. Uh, our mandate is to preserve and present the vast coal mining heritage of the Drumheller Valley, the emphasis on the 1930s era. Our mission statement to enhance appreciation for Alberta's coal mining heritage, emphasis on the Atlas Coal Mine and Drumheller Valley through the preservation of and interaction with unique artifacts, buildings, stories, and landscape. I don't think I need to read this whole thing, but I will. Vision of the Atlas Coal Mine <laughs> is to instill a sense of wonder about the past, our mining heritage to visitors of all ages, and to become stewards in fostering respect for history in a safe and enjoyable place. So we are not a museum in the standard sense. We are a historic site. And the bulk of our visitor experience is about people coming and doing things rather than looking at things in glass cases, looking at artifacts. We actually take you underground. You can you know, go through the underground tunnel. You can ride an old mine train. It's experience space for us. So in 2015, we undertook our reorg project. Uh, we had a few reasons for this, probably similar to just about everybody here. We found that our storage facilities were beginning to come cramped. They were too small, uh, incomplete policies and procedures that we needed to develop. And we really needed to take control at that time, plan for the future, and make some progress. Uh, our, at the time, executive director, Julia Fielding, uh, had used REORC previously at the Clarington Museum and Archives in uh, Bowmanville, Ontario. I wasn't aware of this, but uh, apparently it, she was the impetus for a few people taking on this project, and I wasn't aware that I was the only one who sort of did REORG in a vacuum. I didn't know you guys... <laughs> I didn't know everybody had all this support from the REORG community and that <laughs> we're kind of flying on our own. And so from May 2015, about four or five month period, we undertook REORG. I'm really amazed with you guys who did projects in three days, five days, ten days. I mean, we, we took our time. Uh, you guys have, from what I can tell, a larger uh, volunteer core to help you. For us, it was pretty much me and one assistant. And I think we really need to pursue getting some more volunteers to help us with this kind of project. So as I said, uh, we are not a standard museum. Uh, we are an industrial heritage site. We are nationally and provincially designated. 31 hectares, dozens of buildings, hundreds of machines, vehicles, active railway tracks, and all the documentary data and documents that were surviving from the era, all were donated en masse to us in 1984. Uh, about five years after the coal mine closed, our benefactor, Sir Omer Patrick, donated the entire site to the Historic Society for $1. Uh, he felt really bad that he couldn't provide coal mining jobs to the community, so he figured might as well earn some tourism dollars from the site. The biggest concern about our site is that we are a nationally designated site. We cannot alter our site in any way. Our buildings are all provincially protected, nationally protected, and so is our site. So I can't adapt our buildings. I can't add buildings to site. I can't 
bolt a shelf to the wall even. So we, we have some really unique challenges to face here. As uh, most of you have probably also experienced, we have a small collections budget and very frequent staff layover. Um, generally, every year we would have one collections technician. I'm the first one to be full-time for more than a year at a time. Generally, you're getting about four months out of a collections member. So as you can imagine, over the years, standards, uh, quality of work has varied greatly. So the two main challenges facing our site are physical nature of our site and also issues of staffing. So let's go down the rabbit hole. Let's say coal mining tunnel in Drumheller. So nature of the site, we are not a self-contained building. Our collections are scattered between probably a half dozen buildings on site. Many artifacts are outdoors. Some are in underground tunnels. Uh, this obviously raises concerns about collections mapping, object circulation, retrieval. Really complicates things. As I said, I cannot alter buildings, cannot alter the site. And we also do not have any off-site storage. Uh, wonderful as that would be, it just doesn't fit our budget at the time. Uh, we have a number of in immovable objects. Uh, you'll see them coming up, but uh, several of our machines weigh several tons. If I can just relate a, a short story. In 2016, I believe, we were donated a coal cutter. A coal cutter is essentially a giant chainsaw for cutting into the coal face. Uh, the cutter blade can be up to 16 feet long. So my boss came up to me and said, someone wants to give us this coal cutter. Uh, it's currently sinking into a farmer's field. It's the middle of winter. How do you think we can get it here? Uh, first of all, we've got to wait till the end of winter so we can dig the thing out. And then they said, well, I've got my one-ton pickup truck. Do you think, uh, you know, it's sufficient to carry this coal cutter? I said, well, how much can it carry? He says, 2,000 pounds. It's, well, this machine weighs 16,000 pounds, and it's going to flatten your truck. And that's not even close to the biggest machines we have on site. Uh, to get this coal cutter onto site, we had to recruit an 18-wheeler and a large construction crane. And obviously, with you know, the nature of our site and our budget, this is not something we can regularly do. Uh, so frequently, we'll, we'll get a large machine. And once we put it somewhere, it's, it's staying there for at least 10 years. Uh, finally, weather in the Drumheller Valley uh, fluctuates greatly plus 40 to minus 40. Um, sunlight, very bright in the summer, so we have lots of conservation issues associated with that. So, pest control. That's one of the first things that Reorg pointed out to us, where we're, you know, lagging behind. Uh, you can see in this image, this is our collection of original tipple blueprints. And for whatever reason, mice love this material. They chew it up and they make their nests out of it. Uh, these documents are irreplaceable to us. We've collected all the shreds in hopes that one day we can put them back together, but I think that's a bit of a pie-in-the-sky endeavor. Uh, but So we've tried to remedy this situation as best we could in this shelving. You can't really see the shelving unit, but some flat drawers. They've got these perfect little mouse size holes in them. You know. So we've plugged the holes, we've scattered mouse baits, traps around site, and we incentivize our staff to keep on top of these uh, uh, traps, checking the traps, and we actually tally our kill score on a, <laughs> on a chart on the front of my office. I'm in third place. <laughs> uh, insects. Uh, fortunately, we haven't had any problems with mites or moths, things that you would typically think you know, would be pretty damaging to your collection. What we do have is a colony of leafcutter bees. 
Uh, leaf cutter bees are pretty docile. They're not going to sting you unless you, you know, try to catch one in your hand. But they are a nuisance to our visitors. They've taken up residence at the entrance to one of our exhibit buildings. So it's really detracting to their visit when they open the door and they're, you know, bees buzzing around. So, but we can't relocate them. They're an uh, important indigenous species. They're, you know, valuable pollinators. So we have to sort of, you know, accommodate them as much as I wouldn't like to. Uh, the best we can do is sort of do a public education campaign and say these are an important species. They're not going to harm you. Just let them be and everyone will be okay. Birds are also a concern. Uh, there's thousands, if not millions, of barn swallows in the Drumheller Valley. Uh, they generally live in the riverbanks, but they find our buildings just as accommodating of a place to live. So we're constantly fighting with them and barn owls. <laughs> this is raindrop. Uh, I think we're one of the few museums in the world that actively employ barn cats <laughs> to combat our rodent problem. Uh, raindrop, or as we commonly call her, Lady Wildfire. Uh, wildfire was our brand of coal. So she, she lives in our, our office. She patrols the grounds and helps us keep the mouse problem in check. And she's in first place on our kill chart. <laughs> Uh, we have some security issues. This is the door to our main storage facility in 2015. You can see I could squeeze through that gap pretty easily. Uh, this should say in 2015 we identified security as a priority, but at the time we deemed it too expensive to implement buying cameras and motion detectors, things like that. Unfortunately, we were quickly taught a lesson. Uh, in this photo here, let's see two uh, antique telephones. These are special telephones. They're permissible mine telephones. They weigh about 40 pounds each, and they're encased in a great deal of steel to uh, pre prevent the sparking internal mechanism from setting off a methane explosion underground. And unfortunately, someone made off with one of these. Um, I imagine they squeezed through that gap. and. You know, it was a big loss for us. I noticed there's some antique phones here, so if anyone ever tries to donate a 40-pound telephone, please point them in our direction. But part of what Reorg did for us is it encouraged regular checks on our collection. And I got a call one morning saying, Ken, we think someone's broken into our storage facility, but it doesn't look like anything's missing. I said, okay, I'll come check it out. And I walked into the what we call the artifact shed, and I immediately recognized that one of these telephones was missing. And that comes from my experience of viewing the collection. You know, I've, I've been in this shed hundreds of times. I know where things are supposed to be. I'll recognize if something's missing. But with our frequent staff layover, people who haven't been inside the facility as much, they're not going to notice. So I noticed. We notified the police. We didn't get it back, unfortunately. Uh, but it did provide the impetus for us acquiring security cameras, motion detectors. And we also had to take some unconventional paths to uh, securing our site. We're quite rural. As I said, about 15 minutes outside of Drumheller. You'd think being so remote would protect our site. And in some degree, it does. But it also makes us vulnerable because no one, as soon as our staff leaves at night, no one is there keeping an eye on our site. So we, we had to really press the police to come and do regular patrols. And also we had to partner with the local population. There's about a town of about 100 people that live near our site. We really needed to employ them to keep eyes on our site, keep, keep things in check. So I said, object movement is a big problem for us. This is a piece of a rotary dump. So 
So essentially, a train of coal cars would drive into this. That entire circular structure rotates over, dumps the coal out, rotates back, loads the next coal car. And that's only a third of the machine. So we deal with really big objects. Uh, when I'm trying to move objects from storage, I need to go through doorways of different sizes, up and down stairs, indoors, outdoors, and as I said, I cross active railroad tracks. So, you know, moving objects on our site, very complicated. And temperature fluctuation, like I mentioned earlier, it's plus 40 in the summer in the valley, minus 40 as I've been enduring this winter. It's very nice to be out here on the island and get away from this weather. But our buildings built in the 1920s and 1930s were not designed to be still in use today. They certainly weren't designed to be storing collections. So when it's plus 40 or minus 40 outside, it's the exact same temperature inside. So finding suitable storage space is a problem for us. We do the best we can. Uh, like I said, I can't alter the buildings at all. I can't drill into the walls. I can't, you know, build anything substantial. So we need to come up with some unique solutions. Uh, for example, if they're shelving in our main shed, can't drill it to the wall, so all our sh shelves are actually floating, and we strap them to the walls so that we're not damaging the historic buildings. Uh, these, this shot is in our administration office. So our, our archival storage practices are, are pretty good now. You know, they're all bagged and tagged, and can't read it, but it does say, you know, ACM such and such to such and such. We do have the proper cases for our archival elements, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, flooring in our main artifact shed, it is what used to be a truck maintenance workshop. And it doesn't have a floor. Like many of our buildings, it doesn't have a foundation. The floor in our main artifact building is a mix of soil, coal dust, and motor oil. And for a long time, we had objects just sort of sitting in this toxic quagmire. So getting them up off the ground onto shelves or onto pallets, if that's the best we can do, has been really important for us. Archaeological concerns. So in 1984, the entire site was donated to us, and pretty much everything that was there was just left where it lay. So we have an area we call the coal car graveyard. It's a collection of about 100, 150 wooden and metal coal cars that are just sort of sitting on the hillside. And the hillside slowly erodes and buries these objects. So we're not totally certain what to do with them. And, and reorg isn't really designed as an archaeological tool. It doesn't really prescribe how we should address this. But the best option we really have available to us is to just leave them. They slowly get buried. And once they're buried, they're pretty stable. But it, it, <laughs> it's not ideal. Uh, there's an outhouse in our, in our uh, coal car graveyard. And the toilet, you know, would be about this high. It's now flush to the ground. So the silt over the last 20 years has buried things about two feet deep. Sunlight and UV, obviously a concern uh, to any collection. Uh, most of our collections are housed in old houses or office buildings. Not, you know, when you're designing collection storage facilities like the one here, you've got these nice concrete walls with no exterior windows or doors. We don't have that luxury. The best we can really do is coat our windows with UV film. Uh, you know, doors to the outdoors. There's nothing we can really do about that, unfortunately. And issues of staffing. <laughs> the, 
So this is my boss, or one of my bosses, Jay Russell, our director of visitor services, Peter, hamming it up at a recent uh, education conference. My other boss uh, from the East Cooley School Museum. So we have a lot of staff layover, training, and, and skill sets vary greatly from year to year. You know, some years are better than others. I'm fantastic. <laughs> so one of the ways Reorg really benefited us was that there's value to the brand. I feel like if I'd gone to the board three years ago and said, listen, I need $30,000 to do a collections reorganization project. You're going to pay me all summer. I want to buy all these supplies. I think they would have told me where to go. Uh, but because I can say, listen, it's backed by UNESCO, and I always say ICC ROM, but ICROM, that sounds better, <laughs> easier to say. And because it has you know, these mapped out tools and, and processes, it, it really helped me convince the board that this is a valuable project. You know, it, it's very measurable, your progress, the tools are all there laid out for you. So it really helped convince the board that this was a, a worthwhile endeavor. Uh, documentation is another area that we were severely lacking in. Uh, when I first came, the only piece of documentary evidence was a registration ledger. Some people have absolutely horrid penmanship, so about <laughs> half of it I can't read. Um, inventories were never happening. Now we're doing regular collections inventory. Like I said, that helped us notice when items went missing. Object movement ledger. We've developed an object movement ledger. Uh, it hasn't been employed fully. Uh, that's a big goal for us this year is to uh, fully employ the object movement ledger in triplicate. So, you know, saying... Uh, someone has to sign saying, I'm going to the storage facility, retrieve this object, I retrieved this object, and this is where I brought it. And then having either myself or the executive director sign off on any object movement. Limiting uh, staff access to the collections facility is really important. You know, we had a staff member a few years ago, he used to love just going into the shed and grabbing a few artifacts and tossing them in a bag and, you know, walking around site and explaining them to visitors is great for an interpretive uh, way of doing things, but from my point of view, it's a nightmare. As things just turn up in random places or aren't there where I hope to find them. So yeah, I'm the only one with keys to the, the storage facility now. It's not going to happen again. Uh, regular cleaning and maintenance was non-existent. We now have weekly and bi-weekly cleaning and maintenance checks. Uh, we're a very dusty site. It's a coal mine. There's coal dust everywhere. Our parking lot is paved in red shale, which turns into this really fine pink dust. The inside of my car is supposed to be nice black leather, but now it's kind of pink. Um, and we've developed a begun to develop a location coding system. So again, it, it previously absolutely did not exist. We had a really good collections tech last year who's developed a comprehensive coding system, mainly in use in our artifact shed, but also elsewhere on site. I should say that, I'm not sure exactly when, probably about 1994, the first attempt at coding locations was done. And they had a really weird way of going about it. They, they gave areas of our site names like the Willow Dip, and the coal car graveyard, and there's a whole bunch. I mean, I don't know what a willow dip is. I couldn't tell you where that is on our site, but I know there's things in the willow dip. <laughs> uh, so we're, we're trying to implement a, a more reasonable location system coding. And reorg is really where we owe uh, noticing our shortfalls in, the, in this area, and they really helped us develop our documentation policy. 
object location. Uh, so one of my favorite aspects of reorg is the find any object within three minutes, only have to move two objects to access any item. I, I think that's, you know, a great goal. It's at this point pretty unrealistic for us, but we have employed it in every aspect that we can. So these are our, uh, old carbide, or not carbide, electric battery lamps. These are battery packs that the miners wear on their hips. So, you know, they're stacked three deep. They're all in order from first accession on the left to the most recent accessions on the right. Uh, as I said, th this shelving unit is not bolted to the wall. It's strapped to the wall, floats. This is my office, or this was my office. Um, our administration office is an old mine manager's house. And I am one of two people on staff who actually has a door to my office. I'm pretty pretty happy about that. Me and the executive director are, are the only people who can actually shut out the outside world. But this is before reorg. It's obviously a total mess. Uh, these items here have absolutely nothing to do with con conservation or collections. These are our uh, site maintenance guys. You know, bottles of glue and nails and bolts and what have you. Somehow my laundry hamper has made it into the collections <laughs> office. My laundry is on that chair over there. I'm not sure why. But, you know, we really had to make our office a functional space. So that's a little better now. I do have a better desk now. I got a nice big modern desk rather than that antique. Uh, we, this structure here is where we house our most delicate artifacts. Um, I can keep a close eye on them. This is the only building that is heated year-round on our site, so it's the best place for us to store our delicate artifacts. And I wish this item wasn't in my office, but this is actually my favorite item in our collection. It's an old projector, Balopcon projector, and it belonged to one of the original settlers of the Drumheller Valley. Uh, Mr. Moody, who was a coal mine operator, and he would use this uh, projector to attract investors to his company, but he would also use it to entertain the miners and their families on the weekends, show them, you know, slide shows. Uh, we have a fabulous collection of old glass slides from his travels around the Rockies. So it's important to the valley, not only from an industrial and business perspective, but also from a, a family life and, and personal perspective. That's my favorite item in our collection. And unfortunately, it just sits in my office. I would love to get this item out on loan, uh, you know, get it on display, because nobody gets to appreciate it. Condition reports. This is something Reorg really helped us with. Um, this is the control box of a mine locomotive. So last year, some jerk came along and smashed the glass on all the dials. These are outdoors. Oh, wow, I'm going slow, eh? Uh, so without the condition reports, I would have noticed, but maybe our, our regular summer staff wouldn't have. Came along, smashed these dials. Vandalism is an issue. Um, and we're also currently doing condition checks regularly. I'm kind of skirting my responsibility on this since it's minus 40 and there's two feet of snow. I, you know, going out in the winter and minus 40 and checking on rust patterns isn't my idea of a good time. But we do do it uh, just to see how these things are deteriorating because they are outside exposed to the elements year round. Uh, if you look at our machines, there's a a line about six inches up where uh, deterioration is visible and we've realized this is because that's about the average height of the snow cover in the winter. Uh, I know a bunch of you are using Microsoft Access as your collections database. Uh, ours failed on us last year. Uh, fortunately, thanks to Reorg, we were doing monthly backups, so we actually didn't lose any data but our database is totally unusable at this point. 
So a big project for us this year is we're migrating all our data to Pass Perfect, and with the goal of having no errors in our database because in our Microsoft Access over the years, you know, vastly different quality of records being kept in there. Collections budget. Uh, this is a big hindrance to me. Generally, I'm working with about a thousand to five thousand dollars a year. This lets me buy, you know, bags and pens and you know, things to label items, but I can't do any major projects. But when I was preparing this presentation, I thought, well, you know, this tipple is our, our biggest expense, and we spend millions of dollars conserving this. So in some sense, I think I have the biggest budget on site. You know, I don't get to play with those millions of dollars, but in some sense, you know, millions of dollars are going to protect my collection. So it made me feel a little bit better about myself. And finally, uh, last year, through the generosity of the CCI, we were able to send off one vulnerable item to the CCI for conservation. So we sent off a pony helmet. The mine ponies would wear helmets to protect them and allow them to carry their own miner's lamps. And when they sent it back, uh, they told us that it was made out of horse hide. So it's a bit of a macabre <laughs> observation, uh, but it really sort of emphasizes the, you know, make do or do without mentality of the miners. I just hope that Blackie or Dusty or whoever didn't know that he was probably wearing his dad or mom as a helmet. So again, just some things to keep in mind. Who's reorg for is for experts or lay people. I feel like I'm sort of perfectly suited for reorg. I'm not a trained collections tech or collections manager, but I, I'm I fancy myself pretty handy and intelligent. Um, you know, I have a general idea of museum best practice, so I can employ all these ideas. Expense, you know, how much money is it worth? I feel it was fully justified. Our current uh, uh, executive director probably could have done it on her own for less. She's a very highly trained collections manager. Julia obviously agrees that it was worth the expense. Could it be handled by volunteers? I'd say probably not. I think you do need some, you know, firm guidance to carry out a reorg project. Uh, we've, you know, been able to develop some new exhibits, new experiences as a result of reorg. Lots of new documentation, research, and understanding has come out of this. It's our nice little kids' corner. I can color pictures. There's Brad Pitt. <laughs> so if I can go back to that picture of me with really straggly long hair, <laughs> that's where we began. And if this is kind of where we are now, you know. <laughs> I at least got a haircut. My beard's probably needs a trim. That's what we're working towards. <laughs> so, keep digging. Thank you.